Do you charter your boat? I looked up from the boat's stern, eyed the two men with lazy smiles and terrible fishing gear, and sighed. Clearly tourists and trouble, but typically of decent money. So I said, depends, where are you looking to go? It was still mid-morning, plenty of time for a trip and play host to a few amateur anglers. We heard there's a great fishing spot near the oil rig, can you take us there? I shook my head and tried giving them better options, anywhere other than that place. Told them where I'd taken the previous groups that caught huge grouper and chubby amber back. Come on, I heard that oil rigs are the best for shark, that's why we want to go. At that point, I rolled my eyes and pointed at their gear. You really think you're going to catch shark on that pole? One of them laughed, seemingly nervous, and admitted, We're kind of new to this. Of course you are. So listen to a fisherman who's been on these waters for longer than you've been alive. You'll catch nothing good at that place. I turned my attention back to the boat and figured that would be it. They would wander off like all the others, maybe look around the rest of the dock for another boat to bother. Instead, the other guy waves a few hundred dollars. We're willing to pay right now. Three hundred. That's it. I charge three hundred ahead for the day. I was bluffing, but figured that would be more than enough to send them packing. We can do that. I should have told them to get lost. Instead, I was curious and suspicious. Is this really about sharks? Not a single soul I know would ever be that determined to pay so much for a humble fishing vessel. My boat was well taken care of, sure, but it certainly wasn't anything to write home about in terms of luxury. A pause, then the one offering the money says, We're looking for a specific fish. Which is? Spit it out. Finally, the more nervous of the two gives me an honest answer. We've heard rumours of a huge fish, a shark of some sort. The details were fuzzy, but it was big. There's a reward for it. Surely you've heard something about it. I had at the bar, most likely where these two heard as well. The bounty was a good one, and had some hotspot tourists eager to try for it. Over two grand in cold cash. But I saw the state of the boat, the endless blue it was called, that supposedly caught the thing first. The hull had scratches in it that were difficult to describe. It barely made it back to shore, and the captain refused to step foot on another boat. Instead, he worked at the local fish shack and drank heavily the moment the day was done. He lost his best friend to the sea and couldn't really describe what they caught out there. Only ever saying it was large with sharp teeth. They managed to haul it on the boat, but couldn't keep it. It killed the captain's best friend before escaping back into the water. Shark was the first thing that came to mind, but I really wasn't sure about that. There isn't any shark I know of that's capable of scarring a boat like that, literally peeling off long strips of paint and wood. And you somehow think you're going to catch a big fish with those rods? The fishing poles in their hands looked maybe good enough to handle a decent sized red snapper. Nah, these are just to pass the time. We've got a real rod in here. The more cocky man holds up a large case and admits, we wanted something else to pass the time while hoping for the big guy. I folded my arms, thinking, then said, and you think two newbies like yourselves can catch something that a skilled angler couldn't? Hey, what's the harm in trying? The reward money is insane. So, what do you say? I was about to say no, but he kept going. 600 bucks right now to take a few guys out in the water, and if we only catch small stuff, then it is what it is. It was difficult to deny, so foolishly, I agreed. The attack happened in the late evening, so I figured it would be an easy day's work. I had the guys help me load the boat with fresh bait and made sure that there was enough fishing line and hooks. As we worked, I learned their names and gave them mine. The more nervous one was Liam. The other was Grayson, who was a little too relaxed for my liking. Nonetheless, I gave them the rundown on how to act to my boat and that they needed to listen to me 
no matter what. Is it just you who runs the whole boat, Mr. Blackburn? Liam asked as I filled up the cooler with ice. I nodded and checked about the stern one last time to make sure that everything was in place. After that, I showed the two the cabin so they could relax or sleep until it was time to fish and said, On occasion, I'll hire one of the younger guys if I'm taking out a large group. But other than that, just me. That sounds like a nice gig. You know, I'd like a boat someday. I glanced over to Grayson before moving back to the doorway, thinking to make sure we had everything before replying. You better enjoy the water if you do that. Sit tight, it's going to be a few hours before we get near the rig. If you need anything, I'll be in the captain's chair. I undid the ropes tying the boat and got behind the helm, readying myself for a long day. The ride out to the oil rig was thankfully quiet. The calls from the other boaters drifting away, the annoying cries of seagulls left behind, and all that was left was the ocean and its sounds. In the far distance, I could see the oil rig, but knew it would take a few hours to get close. Neither men were terrible passengers. Both stayed in the cabin for the most part, though Liam sometimes wandered up to ask random questions about being a fisherman. I'd humor him for a while, until he eventually got bored and went off to the cabin again. The sun was high in the sky when I pulled up close to the rig. The sight of it had me feeling uneasy, even with a sunny afternoon, but I cut the engine after moving the boat to a safe distance away. On the sonar, it seemed that a decent amount of fish were hanging about, but not quite as many as I expected. Still, I moved out onto the front of the boat and dropped the anchor to ensure the waves wouldn't push us around. Are we finally here? Liam asked, looking about, gripping the edges of the cabin door to keep balance. Yeah, let your buddy know. I busied myself, adding weights to the lines and baiting them, putting one on each side to hopefully avoid lines being tangled. Grayson grinned and put on sunglasses the moment he stepped onto the deck. I'm so ready for this. We're going to be here for a while. Fishing takes time and we may not catch a thing. In a way, I hoped that would be the case. The biggest thing I wanted to catch was a grouper or a snapper. Easy and simple to deal with. At first, nothing but a few small fish, but not anything that could be kept. The small rods had nibbles or small bites, but the rod meant the true deep sea fishing wouldn't move beyond the natural pull from the waves. I asked if they wanted to move on, but Grayson insisted that we stay close to the oil rig, so I moved the boat to the other side. How come this isn't in use anymore? Do you know? Liam asked as I helped him bait the hook, showing him how to pierce the squid so that it would stop falling off. Couldn't say for sure, but supposedly there were issues with the pipes. They got the rig in place, but could never get the pipes right. The oil rig stood beside us, casting a shadow over the water and eerie in its silence. There were no sounds of workers milling about, just an abandoned structure that had no use anymore. It had been a huge bust, I recalled from the papers. Talks about how it cost millions to make and float the thing out to sea and sink it under the ocean floor. The amount of piping flown and tugged out was insanely expensive as well, only for it to be for nothing. The company couldn't get it to work. Constant breakdowns, industrial accidents, workers refused to work until finally it was left alone. Grayson huffed, his mood steadily souring with each empty hook or small fish caught. Pipes? That's it? So what, they've just left it out here to rust? You could say that, yeah. Some companies talk about trying to salvage it, but nothing really came of it. Nowadays, nobody goes near the thing. That had Liam asking if I heard the rumours surrounding the structure, and I shrugged. As in everyone, once the salvation companies backed off or left the contracts, everyone started talking about what it's really used for. I heard someone mentioning criminals use it for hiding illegal stuff, or that the government is doing experiments there. Liam glanced over to me, then continued. Have you heard anything weird going on here? I had to roll my eyes at that one, and said, You're here in town for fun, aren't you? Stop listening to the old anglers and gossipers. 
and be a real tourist like your friend. That got a sharp response from Grayson that I ignored. Instead, looking up at the oil rig and told him, A few people say it's haunted. There were some accidents of men drowning or suddenly going missing during the night. The missing men, I'm not sure about, but people did drown out here. Haunted? Seriously? Grayson rolled his eyes as he tugged at his rod, leaning against the side of the boat. Well, what do you think? I looked away from the structure and watched Liam cast out his line. Truth be told, I had no real reason to dislike it other than a bad feeling. More than enough for an experienced sailor, as I said as much. And I said as much. Doesn't matter what I think. I don't like the thing, so I stay away from it. Unless money's involved. The guy's tone was too cocky, but still, it did ring true. My reply was still scathing. Maybe, but I don't expect us to catch a damn thing out here, so this will be your loss, not mine. Silence fell over us at that point, both men trying and failing to catch anything worthwhile. Eventually, Liam gave up. I'm done for the day. Gray, I don't think we're going to get anything. Let's just call it. By then, the sun was starting to fall from the sky, so I warned them. Another hour is all we can afford, any longer, and we'll be docking in the complete dark. All I get is three hours of actual fishing? That's a waste of 600 bucks. I shrugged, unwilling to budge. Fine, whatever. You're the one that refused to move from this spot. We could have easily went somewhere else, but you insisted on staying here. Don't blame me. I should have known better than to feel relieved, but I couldn't help it. Knowing that I would be away from the oil rig in less than an hour had me feeling better, even a bit giddy. An easy day with a good payout, more than enough to pay the rest of the bills for the month. We baited the large rod and pulled the other lines in. I felt a bit bad with how disappointed Grayson clearly was. His cockiness nowhere to be found, and instead he stood near the line, staring out into the water with a frown and slumped shoulders. On the other hand, his friend seemed far more relieved with the idea of getting back to dry land, already in the cabin and mentioning to wake him once we're docked. I offered to chum the water for the last half hour, figuring it wouldn't hurt to try and tie something big enough for us to bring in. At least then, the two could say they caught a nice amberjack or even a shark. There wasn't much bait left anyway, and I'd rather feed the fish than the gulls or pelicans that crowded the docks. Blood sardines and bits of squid swirled around in the water as I tossed the bait near the fishing line. Not a lot, just enough to hopefully catch something's attention before I left the last few pieces for the hook. I'm gonna look at the sonar, see if anything is nearby. Grayson nodded as he took the pole, reeling in the line to bait it again, then cast out. I watched him for a moment before heading to the captain's seat and examined the sonar. There wasn't much. It seemed that most of the fish earlier in the day had left. I watched it for a few minutes, then glanced at my watch and sighed at the time of almost 4.30. We would be docking around 7 at this point, but at least it wouldn't be completely dark. Hey, I think I got something. That had me looking at the sonar again. A bit confused since nothing had showed up, but I didn't dwell on it for long. I walked back to the deck, curious to see what fish Grayson hooked, and saw the way he was struggling with the weight. He would reel for a few seconds and pull at the rod, arms trembling, and I quickly guided him to the fishing chair. Sit down before you lose the pole. I helped him put the pole into the metal holder and motioned for him to continue. The rod was bending pretty good, so I warned him. Probably a shark, it might cut the line. I hope not, this is what I've been waiting for. He laughed and tried calling for Liam, who responded with a simple, Good luck, I'm too tired, and nothing else. Get up here, man, you're going to miss the catch of a lifetime. There was no response this time, and Grayson huffed, then turned his focus onto getting the fish to the surface. I reminded him that it was fine if the fish decided to take off, cautioned him that trying for brute strength would only exhaust them faster. If he wants to run, let it run. You're not going to win a fight like that. Rest, then keep going. 
It was a long fight. A fight that I left briefly to poke my head into the cabin to see how Liam was doing. He was laid out in one of the booths with an arm over his face. You were right. Yeah, I've never really been on the ocean before and I think the sun's starting to get to me. He looked over at me, a bit dazed in his eyes, and I frowned, going to the small fridge and grabbing some water. You weren't drinking much water out there, that'll help you feeling terrible. Here. Yeah. He sat up, slumping in his seat, but at least took the bottle, sipping on it. Mr. Blackburn, do you hear things out here? That was an odd question, and one that had been raising an eyebrow. Sometimes, the ocean has a lot of things in it, and not all of them sound right in a boat. What did you hear? He hesitated, twisting the cap on and off the water bottle, then said, I don't know. It was weird, like a hum, or a vibration. Whale songs, probably. They sound different in a boat, since we're in the water with them. That makes sense. I was just wondering. I'm going to sleep some more. Is that okay? He drank a bit more from the bottle, then put it next to his head, already laying back down. Sure, we'll be heading back soon. He nodded at that, and already seemed to be dozing off. I went back to see how Grayson was doing, and peered out into the water, looking for signs of the fish. It took another five or so minutes until the grey skin of a shark became visible on the surface. Certainly not the biggest I'd seen, but nice-sized. Yeah, Grayson yelled, laughing as he stood up to look at the prize he'd brought up from the depths. I put on some thick gloves and motioned for him to keep on reeling. He's still got some fight left. Sure enough, the shark took back off towards the ocean floor, disappearing from my sight. I grabbed the harpoon, readying myself for when it reached the surface again. The line kept going, the reel loud, and I glanced back to see that it was going oddly fast before it stopped. Grayson gritted his teeth and pulled at the pole, tried his damnedest to reel, but the wheel of the rod wouldn't turn. Did he get stuck? He kept at it, arms shaking with the effort, and he reached out to touch the line. It was tight, no slack at all, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. There weren't any wrecks as far as I knew for the shark to hide or take shelter in, and most fish don't get a second wind like that. I put the harpoon down and grabbed the line with both hands to pull. Still, no give, but I felt something on the line. A tiny bit of movement, and it had me letting go. The shark was still there, but it didn't feel right. My gut was telling me to let the fish go and get the hell away from that spot, an instinct I was going to listen to. I took out a pocket knife, and unfolded the blade. Grayson jumped up and protested. Don't cut the line. Can you pull the fish in or not? He glared but sat back, gripping the pole until his knuckles went white and really did put his all into it. Nothing. The line wouldn't give. The pole bent underneath his attempts, but it wouldn't move an inch. What is wrong with this thing? He grunted and strained his back. I turned my eyes toward the water, but the ocean was silent. I'm calling it. We need to get going. It'll be dark soon, I said, and put the knife against the line. No, give me a chance. You can't reel it in. You've been trying, and it's not moving. Grayson snapped right back. I paid you, didn't I? So let me try again. He kept trying to move the reel, and began complaining that there was something wrong with the rod. The reel was broken. I shook my head because his gear was more than adequate for a shark of decent size. I put the knife out again and ignored the protests and curses flung at me. Don't do it! Just as I grabbed the line to hold it steady, it slackened and Grayson reeled away. I barely had enough time to snatch my hand back. Told you I get it. The way he was reeling wasn't right if the fish was still there. The line was coming in too fast. Rather than pointing that out, I kept my mouth shut and waited until something emerged from the depths. The shark, or rather the head, hung from the end of the rod, and I couldn't stop the shiver down my spine. Whatever had eaten the rest of it had sharp teeth.
that's for sure. But it looked wrong. Not like a single bite from a large predator. It seemed that there were small bites taken at a time. Bits of flesh dangling and blood dripping onto the deck. The sides of the head had long scratches down it, gorging out both eyes and exposing jaw tissue. I got the hook out of the mouth and showed the head to Grayson, who looked surprised, then excited. Whoa, we should keep at it. See if we can get the shark that did this. It's got to be the one with the bounty. Not the response I wanted, and one I scowled at. We're done for the day. If you want to come back out with another boat, you do that. Come on, imagine being the guy that brought in a huge monster shark or something. You're really going to make us go back? Yes, I am. Dropping the shark's head back into the water, I grabbed the pole and put it with the others. This is my boat and it's getting dark. I didn't sign up for night fishing. I ignored the complaining and went to the anchor, eager to be done for the day. The windlass to bring the anchor into the boat whirled to life, motor chugging along for a few moments before it shuddered and stopped. With a curse, then a sigh, I fired it back up a few times, but it refused to budge. The motor whined louder and I stopped it. The idea of it being stuck seemed unlikely. The seabed below was muddy and sandy, not a lot of rocks or things for it to get caught on. Still, I reached over and tugged on the rope myself. It was taut and tense, unwilling to give. With a curse, I let out more slack and tried again, only for it to be worse than before, and an uneasy feeling settled over me once again. It was just like the fishing line. Then, slowly, the boat began to move. At first, bit by bit, then yanked forward and Grayson and Liam shouted at me. Only, I wasn't doing anything. All I could do was hold onto the bow's railing and try not to be flung overboard. My heart hammered away in my chest. I was frozen until a particularly hard pull had me retching for my knife and soaring into the thick rope holding the anchor. It wasn't easy cutting through it. The boat must have around looped the oar rig before the rope gave way, snapping and disappearing into the waves. The boat rocked violently then settled down, but I wasn't taking any chances. I was on my shaking legs and rushed to the helm. What the? Get in the cabin or sit down, I snapped at Grayson, turning on the motor to full power and steering back towards land. He actually did, sat on the floor and looked pale sunglasses falling from his nose and onto his chest. You... you weren't driving earlier? How were we moving? Something had the anchor and wouldn't let go. What would do that? For once, a question from him that was a good one, but one I had no answer to. I hesitated, then simply said, We're getting out of here. Hey guys, do you hear the singing? I glanced back confused, and saw Liam swaying back and forth, cheeks red and eyes glazed. Grayson was the one to ask what he meant, and he elaborated. In the cabin, I can hear someone singing. Does it sound like either of us are having a good time? What's with you? You don't look so good. Grayson got up and reached for his friend's shoulder, shaking him a bit. Sit tight, we'll be back at the hotel soon. Okay... I'm going to get some fresh air. He wandered away, stumbling a bit, though I wasn't sure if it was from the choppy water or from a sudden bout of seasickness. Grayson glanced at me, a look of concern on his face, and I waved him away with my hand. I wouldn't let him be on the deck by himself. Rather than a snappy reply or comment, he left without a word, and I turned my attention on getting back to shore. I was focused trying to calculate how long it would be until we were back to porch, when Grayson screamed. Stop the boat! He rushed to me, eyes huge and spit out. Stop the damn boat! Liam's in the water! That had me throwing the boat into neutral and using the momentum to turn around. Peering through the window, I looked out for him and saw his orange shirt, taking care to approach slowly so I wouldn't miss, or worse, hit him. Grayson rushed out into the bow, leaning over, and I shouted at him, Don't you fall in too. 
I watched as he tried to grab his friend, failing, then trying again. Come on, Liam. Liam! I couldn't see the kid, but I could hear the desperation and pleading in Grayson's voice. What's with you? Just take my hand! It was a risk, but I killed the motor and quickly got into the bow as well, but stopped when I saw the look on his face. His eyes were open, pale face, and he was staring up at us, but he wasn't seeing us. His arms floated uselessly around him and the water began to cloud, slowly, then quicker and quicker, turning red. I leaned down, hands twisting into the shirt and grunting with the effort of hauling up 200 pounds of dead weight. Grayson, help me! Another set of hands joined mine, and after a minute of struggling, we pulled him onto the boat. Blood and water poured around Liam. I had to keep my jaw shut tight to keep me from vomiting at the sight of his legs. He'd only been in the water for maybe five minutes, but there was hardly anything left from the thighs down. Bits of muscle twitched, the bones red and exposed to the air, the skin and most of the flesh completely gone. Liam? Grayson sobbed, shaking his friend who offered no response, only staring off into the sky. I took off his belt and wrapped it hard around a bit of the good leg left, snapping at Grayson to do the same. His hands were shaky, but he managed to take off his own belt and copy my movement for the other leg, tears falling down his face. It was useless looking back. I knew at the time it was pointless. He was clearly gone, but I felt I had to stem the bleeding. It took both of us to get him back onto the boat. Grayson sat with him insisting that he was going to be okay. I opened my mouth when the singing began, sort of wobbling and faint, coming from the ocean. Wide Eyes looked at me and I looked right back, not sure what to tell him. Before either of us could speak, Liam began shifting, blinking and suddenly back with us. It's so pretty. Can't you hear it? He smiled then, eyes glazed, and began humming along, at times mouthing words. Get us out of here, Grayson whispered, then looked at his friend and tried comforting him. You can't move, buddy. Don't listen to that, okay? You're gonna be alright, we'll get you fixed up. He had to hold him down. It was the only way to keep him from sitting up, or worse trying to stand on what was left of his legs. I crept back to the controls of the boat, practically crawled across the bloody deck and slowly pulled myself up to sit in the chair. In the light of the dying sun, I could make out figures in the ocean. What they were exactly, I couldn't say. But there were many of them. Dark shadows in the ocean with long bodies. I focused on the boat controls, refusing to look up and reach for the radio. It was difficult putting into words what happened when asked what the emergency was, other than, there was an accident, I have an injured passenger on board. All I could offer to the Coast Guard when asked how hurt the patient was, was very. The singing followed us and Grayson stumbled next to me, staring out into the water and said, I think he's dead. We're going as fast as we can. Should I just push him into the water? That's what they want, right? I looked over to us, alarmed at the way his eyes looked glassy. Neither of us are doctors. We don't know that. I hesitated and patted the seat next to me. Sit for a bit. Grayson stood for a moment too long, but then finally did so and stared off into the ocean with a wide-eyed look. You know, they do sound kind of pretty. Don't listen to them. I reached over and dug my fingers into his shoulder. Listen to them and you're going to end up like Liam. Even though he nodded his head and murmured some kind of agreement, I don't think he actually heard me. Throughout the ride, he talked of the song, at times standing up and peering intently out the window, eyes blank and seeing something I couldn't. I wonder what it'd be like to swim with them. What do you think they are? Stop talking, Grayson. We'll be docked in an hour. 
Thankfully, the singing ceased after another 30 minutes, but I couldn't shake the bad feeling welling up inside. Not even the sight of land was enough to make me feel better, carefully docking into the harbour where an ambulance was waiting. The paramedics didn't know what to say once they saw the state of Liam. They quickly loaded him up and whisked him away. I had little answers for the Coast Guard, only able to tell them we were fishing by the oar rig. Don't go out there anymore. That was the only advice they gave, and wrote down something in a report, before asking Grayson a few questions. He barely responded, beyond that he and Liam paid for a fishing trip, hoping to find the shark that wrecked the endless blue fishing boat. After that, the Coast Guardsman let us be. Grayson continued looking out to sea, a wistful look on his face, an expression I didn't like, so I nudged him and offered, do you want a cab? He said nothing for a moment, and only when I asked him again did he finally respond. No, I'm okay. I think I'll take a walk on the beach actually. I heard the ocean is nice at night. I protested and attempted everything I could think of to convince him otherwise, but he simply waved me off. I'll be alright. Thanks for the trip, Mr. Blackburn. See you in the water. His last words still echo in my head. William Ackers was dead upon arriving to the hospital. The officials calling his death a freak fishing accident and wouldn't give out any true details. Grayson Seaver was reported missing the same night by his girlfriend, citing that he never returned from his fishing trip with his good friend. When the police turned up on my door, all I could give them was that Grayson went for a walk on the beach and the dock was the last place I saw him. They didn't bother me after that. I haven't been in the water since that day, months ago at this point. Some of my fishing buddies and fellow captains pestered me about it, reassuring me that whatever happened to Liam wasn't my fault. I pretend that's the reason why I don't go out anymore. At night, I can hear them. The singing. It echoes in my head and follows me to sleep. The captain of the Endless Blue approached me one night at the bar, sitting next to me and asked quietly, You hear them too, don't you? I couldn't even play dumb. He saw the look on my face and nodded his head, looking far more relieved than he had any right to. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Does it get any better? No. It gets worse if you're away from the water. Don't go out again unless you want to end up like the others. We've avoided talking to each other since that talk, going our separate ways and pretending like losing our passengers had caused our dislike of the ocean. I sold my boat and now use my experience to help young anglers fish off piers or the beaches. I don't dare touch the water. Sometimes I find myself staring off into the waves and can see long moving shapes with glittering scales. They sing to me, call for me, sometimes laugh at me. So far, I've managed to resist them. For how long I'll be able to though? I don't know.